You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Feast Day Quick Take on Rude Mass. Yes, that was Rude Mass. Rude meaning cross in Old English. Today, the feast is more commonly called the Finding of the Holy Cross. She was 74 years old and unstoppable. St. Helen, empowered by her lively faith and indomitable spirit, and provided the means for a great expedition by her son Constantine, set out for Jerusalem to find the true cross in the year 326 AD. 293 years after the death of Christ, the seas of contention had only just calmed enough to allow for such a pilgrimage. Diocletian and Maximian, the last of the great enemies of the early church, were dead, and Constantine had taken the throne in 324. The coast was clear, and Constantine's mother, who had been told in a dream to seek the true cross, packed her trunks as soon as she was able, which was not soon enough for her taste. She was unstoppable, this woman. Accompanied by a retinue of enthusiastic Christians, ready to roll up their sleeves and start digging for Christian treasure, literally and metaphorically, Helen directed the unloading of a ship full of provisions at the port of Joppa and prepared for the overland journey to Jerusalem. You can imagine the scene. How anxious Helen would have been to arrive in the holy city and walk in the footsteps of Christ himself to have the opportunity to at last speak with the natives of Jerusalem, to pick their brains, so to speak. Did the people know anything about the history of the relics of Christ? Were the sacred treasures of the Passion spoken of at all among the people? Had any knowledge been passed down by word of mouth since the time of Christ? Even with the power and authority of Rome behind her, there was no guarantee that intel from the natives would be forthcoming. But Helen would likely not have worried too much. She had God's benediction on the project. She knew that. And as she discovered, the people of Israel were anxious to help. After almost 300 years of persecution before Constantine untethered Christianity, the Christian community was still thriving in Jerusalem, and the location of Golgotha was well known. Not only were the Christians able to convey the word-of-mouth traditions concerning the Jewish disposal of the items that had been feared would contribute to Christian devotion, but a Jewish official of the city, in a unique position to know, revealed to St. Helen the exact location of the well into which the chief relics of the Passion had been thrown before the hill was raised. Here following is the history of the finding of the Holy Cross from the liturgy, as recorded by Abbot Garanger in the liturgical year. Upon her arrival, she, St. Helen, ordered to be taken down a marble statue of Venus, which had been erected by the pagans some 180 years before, in order that all memory of our Lord's Passion might be obliterated. She did the same service for the place where reposed the Savior's crib, as also for the site of the resurrection, removing from the former an idol of Adonis and from the latter an idol of Jupiter. The place where the cross was supposed to have been excavated, three crosses were discovered at a great depth below the surface, and with them, though not attached, the title that had been fastened to our Lord's cross. The doubt as to which of the three crosses the title belonged was removed by a miracle. After having prayed to God, Macarius, the bishop of Jerusalem, applied each of the crosses to a woman who had been afflicted with a dangerous malady. The first two produced no results. The third was then applied, and the woman was restored to perfect health. The Holy Cross having been thus found, Helen built a magnificent church in Jerusalem, in which she placed a portion of the cross enshrined in a silver case. The remaining part she took to her son Constantine, and it was put in the church called the Holy Cross in Jerusalem, which was built on the site of the Caesarean Palace. She also took to her son the nails, wherewith the most holy body of Christ Jesus had been fastened to the cross. Constantine passed a law that from that time forward a cross should never be used as an instrument of punishment, and thus what hitherto had been an object of reproach and derision became one of veneration and glory. Now a few facts about the cross itself. 
Relics of the true cross have been studied on more than one occasion and have been found to be made of a species of pine. The wood on which was written the inscription, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, called the Titulus Crucis, is a large enough portion for scientific dating and has been found to have been made of olive wood from the first century. The script is still legible and along with other relics of the crucifixion can be seen in the city of Rome at the Basilica de Santa Cruce in Jerusalem. We know from scripture that the titulus was written in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and so it can be seen on the relic, though the Hebrew portion has been missing since the 6th century. The INRI, recognized on most crucifixes, is the abbreviation from the Latin inscription, which is usually all that fits on crucifixes. But the words, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, is actually written out on the titulus. After centuries of strife and warfare with the Muslims over possession of the holy city of Jerusalem, the large relic of the Holy Cross left by St. Helen was lost and regained numerous times until it was removed for safety to Constantinople in the 7th century. At this point, some accounts say the relic disappeared. Others believe that it was purposely divided and distributed amongst the faithful throughout the world. One fragment, encased in a gold cross, however, was processed in great solemnity back to Jerusalem to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the 11th century at the time of the First Crusade. This symbol of victory of the cross over the Muslim invasion of the Holy Land is celebrated on September 14th, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. This feast day also celebrates the consecration of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem that St. Helena had built to house the relic. Though the triumphant return of the cross to Jerusalem in the 11th century made an important point to the world, it's a fairly well-known fact that the cross or cross fragment that was returned was not the same one that St. Helen had left in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the 300s. By degrees over the centuries, countless places have been blessed by fragments of the relic of the Holy Cross. As far back as the 4th century, St. Cyril of Jerusalem writes that many pilgrims obtained a piece of it, carrying the treasures into their respective countries. St. Paulinus of Nola, who was a contemporary of St. Cyril's, adds that though many pieces were taken, it never lessened the size of the original relic. The centuries have produced many critics of the widespread fragments of the cross, including the heretic John Calvin, who scoffed that so many relics could be authentic and that there were enough splinters to build a ship. Charles Roald de Fleury, an architect and writer of the late 19th century, intrigued by the controversy, decided to find out for himself. Uniquely capable due to his profession and a determined investigator, he made a scientific study to determine the likely size of Christ's cross, then located the many surviving relics around the world, measuring and cataloging all the known pieces. After mathematically reconstructing the fragments by size and volume, de Fleury concluded that if brought together again, the true relics would not reach one-third that of a cross measuring three or four meters, which is 10 to 13 feet in height, with a transverse piece of two meters, or approximately six and a half feet. This easily accounts for the many splinters of the Holy Cross venerated throughout the world, plus those that have been lost or undocumented. It comes down to this, though, regardless of de Fleury's findings. It may very well take thousands and thousands of splinters to compose an entire crucifix, but if God wanted, he could provide millions, multiplying them like the loaves and fishes to nurture devotion amongst the faithful. It's really not a matter for controversy. God can do as he pleases. If a parish is blessed to have in its possession a relic of the Holy Cross, it will usually be brought out for veneration on Good Friday, on the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross in September, and today on Rood Mass. Which brings us back around to the finding of the true cross, and in particular, the finder. We don't know for sure, but many believe St. Helen had been a secret Christian for many years, who only announced her faith when Constantine issued the Edict of Milan in 313, making Christianity legal in the Roman world. Helen would have been 63 at the time. 
She had turned 74 by the time she finally made it to Palestine to uncover the symbol of Christianity that had turned the tide of battle for her son, that miracle which turned the tide of history for the world, but which had not immediately converted Constantine. But let's back up a bit. After his miraculous victory over Maxentius on the Milvian Bridge, accomplished under the flag of the cross, Constantine had given freedom of worship to Christians, but he did not make Christianity the state religion. That didn't happen until 67 years later with the Edict of Thessalonica. Constantine did convene the Council of Nicaea, however, to end the destruction of the Arian heresy, and he appears to have had a vested interest in Christianity in general. But most historians agree that Constantine himself didn't actually convert to Christianity until he was on his deathbed. Can you imagine how frustrated St. Helen must have been that her son did not embrace the faith? How could the man who'd seen emblazoned in the sky the symbol of the cross with the words, In this sign you will conquer, the man who'd had the sign of the cross placed on the shields of his soldiers, the same man who'd gone on to win a decisive battle under the banner of that cross, how could that man be so slow to embrace the cross himself? There is only one answer. People are like that. As much as our unstoppable Saint Helen would have wanted to, she couldn't convince Constantine to convert. With the help of God, Constantine had to convince himself. Every conversion takes its own course. God is the wind blowing the sails, but each soul turns its own wheel. And for some, it takes time to realize they're fighting the wind on the way to the wrong destination. You can bet his mother's prayers, as well as her behind-the-scenes influence, formed a good part of that heavenward wind for Constantine, though. St. Helen died a holy death in 330, and Constantine died with the blessing of the sacraments in 337. You can be sure that from her place in heaven, Helen had a turbine blowing constantly into her son's sails for those seven years in between. Tomorrow, May 4th, is the feast of another mother, the famous saint of mothers, Saint Monica, who prayed and wept and wept and prayed for 17 years before her son, the great Saint Augustine, turned the tiller of his ship heavenward. What many don't know is that Saint Monica prayed for more than 30 years for her husband's conversion too. She was a praying woman. There was no stopping her either. Both St. Helen and St. Monica knew that salvation for their stubborn loved ones lay just over the horizon. It took them years and oceans of tears, but these moms never gave up, and in the end, both saw the grace of God triumph, which gives hope to many of us. I have yet to meet a family who hasn't got a rogue ship or two that they're trying to haul back on course, but we have God's word on it that squeaky wheels get his attention. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus says, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and shall say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, because a friend of mine has come from a journey to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within should answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to thee. Yet if he shall continue knocking, I say to you, Although he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say to you, Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And which of you... If he asks his father bread, will he give him a stone? Or a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he reach him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father from heaven give the good spirit to them that ask him? Persevere in your prayers for loved ones who have strayed, mamas, and sisters, and brothers, and children, and friends. God is listening. Never give up. Be like St. Helen and St. Monica. Unstoppable. <laughs>